set. So hello and welcome everyone to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Spring Break Wildlife with Dave Taylor. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. I want to say a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation and Scotiabank for making this webinar and other programs at Riverwood possible. Before we get to today's presentation, we have a couple housekeeping notes. All of our April webinars are up on our website. Every afternoon this week, we are hosting free webinars on a new topic for spring break. Today, following this program, we have another one uh, with Party Safari, taking you for a virtual meet and greet of an assortment of reptiles, mammals, birds, anthropods, and amphibians. That program starts at 2.30 p.m. and I will post the link in the chat if you wanna register for that. Tomorrow's spring break webinar is on pesky plants, learning all about invasive species of plants, what Riverwood is doing about them, and what you can do in your own backyard. And if you would like to book a virtual program for your class of primary, intermediate, or high school students, please visit the riverwoodconservancy.org slash virtual education. If you have the financial means today to support our programs and conservation of Riverwood's lands, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. We would greatly appreciate any sort of contribution. And today we have our wonderful Dave Taylor back again, who is a wildlife photographer and the author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology. He has produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculums. He's taught science and geography for more than 30 years and produced nature photography and writing for more than 25 years. Dave is also the Education Program Director at the Riverwood Conservancy. Now, before I hand it off to, to Dave today, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type these in the Q&A tab, and all other comments can be put in the chat bar. If you're watching from Facebook, I will be reading these comments and questions as well and bring them back to the group. And I will be posting some resource links in the chat in a few moments. So Dave, I think I have talked enough. I will hand it over to you now. Thank you, Stephanie, and welcome everybody. So the topic today is wildlife. And if you're like me, you will have probably said or experienced when you go outside during this COVID time, uh, especially in the spring, a greater abundance of nature sounds, bird songs in particular. And I know if I go outside uh, the house, I'll hear cardinals and I'll hear robins. Uh, the the red-winged blackbirds have arrived. And people have commented that the wildlife seems to be benefiting from COVID. And certainly, in some ways, it is. One of the things at Riverwood that we've been very curious about for a number of years is how much does noise pollution affect birds singing? And although I don't know that there's a definitive answer to this, we do know that at least one species of bird has changed its song to be better heard during the quiet times of COVID. So presumably it changed its song as traffic got noisier. And the distance sound carries is further. And that's really one of the things that birders are curious about, ornithologists are curious about, if a bird in Riverwood sings, how far does its song go before it's lost to the noise of traffic? And the assumption is because traffic has been down, especially last year, the song could be heard further. And we'll see if there's any answers. Hopefully there's research being done on that. And of course, the same could be said for coyotes calling, uh, geese honking, uh, just whatever. The other thing you hear a lot about is wildlife is more visible. I think possibly wildlife might be more visible simply because people are around homes more often and taking quieter walks. So maybe it is something, um, certainly there are places in the world where wildlife seems to have returned uh, to places that they weren't in, like the canals of Venice and things like that. We'll see if that is really something. 
let's take a look at Riverwood. So I'm going to do a little technology here. Hopefully I can do it without too much coaching. And here we go. You should be seeing the screen. And what you're going to be watching for the next few minutes is a video of Riverwood. The Ministry of Natural Resources defines wildlife as anything that's alive, living, free, and wild. So it excludes cattle, cats, dogs, and people, but it also includes things like fungus and plants and all the various categories of animal life. Riverwood is just a small little island of wildlife. Hopefully it'll grow as it becomes more connected to other parks. And that's certainly in the plans. It changes seasonally. So we get spring ephemeral, ephemeral sorry, I said that wrong, like the trilliums that show up just for a few weeks. We have other plants that are there for much longer. Of course, the trillium doesn't disappear. It simply loses its flower, but it's still there late in the summer. And then we have the changing of the leaves. And if you look at the trees, if you know what you're looking at, you can tell that there are certain soils, certain wetlands where these trees grow. Some trees are more tolerant. So wildlife encompasses those. It does not encompass our garden flowers, but our garden flowers attract wildlife. The insects come, the pollinators, and it's very important for riverwood and for our whole culture to have those pollinators, especially bees. When the bees started to decline not too long ago, there was a real concern that it could put at jeopardy our food supply. So wildlife is very important for our food. Although at the same time, a lot of people feel they have to protect our gardens from wildlife, especially deer, because they will walk right into these gardens and browse away. To me, the loss of a few flowers is worth it. There are some gardeners I know that would disagree with that. Spring is when you're going to hear the most abundant bird sounds. I took a drive not too many months ago to do some recording and it was so quiet because it wasn't, the birds had no reason to sing. Insects, there are probably over a thousand species of insects at Riverwood. I have no idea how many there really are. And there are people that might have a better idea than I, but new species are being found all the time. Insects are very important. And getting back to the question of birds, one of the things we're curious about is as climate changes, will the birds adjust their migratory patterns to coincide with insects that are emerging earlier or later because the climate has changed. So far, it seems like they are. And if you go out in your backyard, you might notice this year, since it's been a fairly mild early spring, that you're seeing birds that you normally wouldn't see for a few weeks. On the other hand, the red-winged blackbirds have returned right on time. Uh, we don't see them a lot because they're underwater, but there's a lot of fish species that live in Mississauga and in the river. Species like musculunge, uh, walleye, bass, they're all here. And if you go to the Riverwoods or the Credit Valley site, they have a list of the fish that you can see there. We're watching the toads to see when they start to sing. They should be singing fairly soon, but we're into a cold snap. Thought they might be heard last week. Now we're getting colder again, and next week is going to be even cooler. So we'll see when they start to sing. And the salamanders will be emerging soon. I've already heard one report of a snapping turtle seen along um, up on Dairy Road area. Uh, it's a little early for them to get out to be laying eggs. And if you do see turtles crossing the road, by all means, protect them. But remember, they're probably on a mission to lay eggs. This is the most dangerous looking snake you'll see in Mississauga. It's the water snake, and it deliberately mimics, mimics rattlesnakes, but it is not poisonous, and it really is quite a nice animal. 
the Riverwood has over 186 species of birds that have been seen here, 186 species. Now they don't all nest on Riverwood and some of them are seasonal and some of them have only appeared once or twice. And we monitor that. Um, every year there's a Christmas bird count, but we have people on the property recording what they see and sharing it. So the 186 species that are listed in our bird brochure, you wouldn't probably be able to see all 186 species in a given year. Uh, bald eagles show up occasionally. Osprey are usually in the fall. Cooper's hawks are year round. And it varies by species. Sandhill cranes have been seen, but not on the ground in Riverwood, only flying over. There is a great uh, interest in birding these days. It is one of the fastest growing hobbies. It's outpaced even golf because people are enjoying it. And I think COVID has just driven it. Uh, so if you're feeding birds or you're out with your camera, photographing them, or you're out with a pair of binoculars, you're not alone. And there are really excellent sites that can help you find birds. And there are certain rules that you need to follow, like don't disturb the birds. And particularly with owls, if you find an owl, do not publicize its location because people have been abusing owls um, and it's led to some bad press for birding. So birding, birders have stopped that. It was only a few individuals that were abusing it. This is the time of year when we're going to see our warblers start to arrive. Generally look for waves of birds coming through once you see the leaves bud out. Not so much the flowers. They need the insects to come back out. And then they'll start to arrive. And if you feed birds, please continue to do so. If you start in the fall, do so through the winter because they come to rely on it. Riverwood is home to a variety of mammals, from the possums and bats to the more common animals. We are blessed in Mississauga that we have a reasonably healthy population of white-tailed deer, probably living within the boundaries of Mississauga, a few hundred, maybe not even that many. Um, but deer are not uncommon and they will take to areas where they've got some space to roam. We're also seeing beavers more often. Coyotes have come in. There are probably more coyotes in the greater Toronto area than there are in Algonquin Park, even though the two areas are in the same, same relative space, occupy the same space. And when I say coyotes in Algonquin Park, I'm also talking about the, the wolf, the Algonquin wolf. Riverwood's a good place to see wildlife. Best time to look for deer any, any time of the year is in the spring, because they're up, it's the green up. As the plants start to green, so do the, the deer come out, and feed on it. Further north, same is true of bears. Riverwood offers a variety of diverse experiences. You can hike our trails. You can wander our gardens. You can go bird watching. You can go hiking. Uh, there are a lot of activities here that I think you will enjoy. And more and more people are getting out and enjoying them. And we welcome you to come to Riverwood but please practice appropriate social distancing, especially on the trails. On a Saturday, on a nice warm Saturday, the trails are so busy that I would really strongly urge you to wear masks. In fact, there are times when I avoid Riverwood because there are just so many people there. We are looking forward to offering a variety of programs at Riverwood to help you learn about the environment, to learn about nature, to learn about wildlife, and hopefully, as we get vaccinated, that will change the whole world around us and we get back to scenes like this. And it's just, it's kind of sad to think that some of these pictures were just taken a little over a year ago. That's sort of my Alfred Hitchcock moment, if you caught it. Riverwood is a wonderful spot all year round. Uh, the best time to see wildlife early in the morning or in the evening. 
a day like today, which is cloudy and overcast, it's a good chance the deer will be active longer. On a sunny day, the deer go in much sooner. Chickadee feeding is great at certain times of the year. So I'm going to exit out of this and come back. And uh, let me just do this. I'm doing some technical things behind the scenes. So Riverwood is a great place. As a wildlife photographer, I started out photographing wildlife locally. I remember talking to a professional photographer when I was a teenager, and I said that I'd like to photograph big game animals eventually. And his advice was, well, start with groundhogs. And that's what I did. Um, you start with the small animals, you learn how to approach them, you learn to observe them. So I've taken my interests locally and I've expanded it. So those videos that you saw were all shot at Riverwood. You can see that our, our, our local area is quite rich in wildlife, but you have to know how to do it to find them, to get their pictures, to see them. But if you start to develop those skill sets, you can apply them when you go on vacation. And certainly uh, one of the joys I have is going out west to photograph grizzly bears or moose or elk, going up to Alaska, going down to uh, South Carolina to photograph migrated, migrating birds and wading birds. Uh, but I also have been fortunate enough to guide safaris in Africa. And we're going to go to one of those locations now. I will advise you that there is some graphic content in this. I've been told by Stephanie that I must make that announcement. So having done so, you have been warned. It's not that graphic, but um, hopefully, here we go. Share, and I hope you're seeing the screen. I'm going to take you to Africa. I've been to Africa 16 times guiding safaris, and there is probably no place better than the Serengeti Mare ecosystem to see wildlife. And one of the animals that you occasionally see are crocodiles, but you're not here for the crocodiles. People come for the lions and the elephants and the big game animals. But there's a story to be told, and as a writer and a videographer and a photographer, I like to tell stories. And one of the great stories, one of the great stories in nature is the story of the wildebeest migration. We think this has lasted forever, just like you think Riverwood has been like it is forever. But in fact, Riverwood and the Serengeti are evolving places. A hundred years ago, the Serengeti was not home to 1.5 million wildebeest. It was home to about 500,000. But things changed. People got sick and they left the area. Cattle disappeared. The grasses grew long. There was these tremendous bushfires that created a grassland. And through this ran a river, the Mara River. It's not much of a river. It's a bit bigger than the Credit River, a bit wider. But in most places, you could walk across it. You'd have to be out of your cotton pick and mine to do so, but you could walk across it. And for the wildebeest, it must be crossed a few times as they follow the rains north and south, seeking fresh grass. And when they cross this river, they come up against crocodiles. And some of the largest crocodiles in Africa are found here. Now, most of the wildebeest will make it across. This crossing that you're seeing went on for five days, literally nonstop except at night. We got up in the morning, we drove there, and there were thousands of wildebeest. And that was only a small percentage of the herd. And they kept coming in and coming. And eventually, one of them crosses the river. And then it's like the dam has busted and all of the animals go into the river. And the crocodiles take a leisurely walk. None of this sliding off the bank like you see in the river in movies. They just walk in because they know there's lots of food here. And in fact, more wildebeest die during the migration 
that are killed by lions, hyenas, leopards, cheetahs, crocodiles combined. Most of them die by accident. The river crossing isn't so dangerous in one sense, but what it is dangerous is there's so many crowded in here. And as they keep coming in, they start to pile up. Some of them get up the bank relatively easily. Some, not so much. They find that the bank is too steep where they've come ashore. And you've got to remember, we're watching this, my clients and myself and lots of other people, and we are thoroughly involved. We are rooting for the animals. We see animals stuck on the rock. We feel bad for them. There's a calf whose mother is drowning or is almost dead and can't get out of the rocks. The calf is struggling. And we're waiting for the crocodiles to put in an appearance. Well, where are they? Well, of course, they're under the water. So we wait and we wait. And we watch this drama unfold. And everybody is quiet. Cameras are taking pictures. And you're surrounded by wildlife. Thousands of animals are crooning around your vehicles. It is just an amazing experience. And it keeps going. And then you see something odd. There's an animal that's behaving strangely. And you look carefully and a crocodile has grabbed it by its snout. But this is a bull wildebeest. The bull wildebeest doesn't give up easily. The crocodile and the wildebeest probably weigh about the same. But the wildebeest drags the crocodile across the river almost to the bank. And then another crocodile shows up and we think, oh, this is it. Everybody goes, hush, what's going to happen? Crocodiles are certainly going to get this wildebeest. But no, the one crocodile grabs the spot from the other one and chases the little one away. Now the bigger crocodile has the wildebeest. But watch. The crocodile loses its grip and the wildebeest stumbles onto the bank, unbloodied, unhurt, and escapes. But the calf, it's over in seconds. And that's one calf that will not make the journey. But the calf was doomed anyhow because its mother had died on the rocks. And you, you wonder, who do you root for? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Well, when the wildebeest escaped, we all cheered. And when the calf died, we all went, ah. But in reality, this is nature. Crocodiles have a role to play. They keep the numbers of wildebeest within bounds. The wildebeest are seasonal, so the crocodiles have to do something else. Scavengers come in and feed on the hundreds of wildebeest that have drowned and clean it up. And when you go out onto the plains, there's nothing but wildebeest to see for miles. Nature is a balance. And I'm going to just stop that. One second, and we'll start playing it again. And exit. There we go. And I'll stop share someplace. You're good, Dave. You're already stopped sharing. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. I didn't know if I'd done that or not. No problem. <laughs> okay. So, Start locally with wildlife, think globally. That's a message I keep giving over and over again. If you can photograph a chipmunk, you'll probably improve, well, you not probably, you will definitely improve your skills photographing wildebeest and lions. Um, the one thing that I'm often asked is how can you help wildlife? And that basically the answer is care about nature, love nature, get out and see it enjoy it, value it, and places like the Serengeti won't exist unless people go there, unless people care about it. Um, not too long ago, a few years ago, there was a, a campaign to save the grizzlies in a particular national area, national park, and somebody wrote a really good op-ed and basically said that even if they never visit this particular national park or the Serengeti, 
just caring that it exists is really important. If we can do that and we can support it through membership in places like um, oh, Canadian Wildlife Federation or Ontario Nature or uh, Nature Canada, by supporting those, by, by reading National Geographics, by valuing nature, even if you don't get out there, you are doing some good. So I really encourage you to do that. Stephanie, I think we'll take some questions if we may. I have another pro thing to show, but we'll go with some questions first. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple of questions have come in. Um, first one we'll start with, is there any poisonous snakes in Mississauga? No, there are not. And I should point out that Mississauga is did not give its name to the rattlesnake that is found in Ontario, which is the Massasauga rattlesnake. And the closest population of poisonous snakes to Mississauga would be up in Georgian Bay. But having said that, I will caution you, if you are out and you happen to pick up a snake and it bites you and you have a reaction, you are probably reacting to having an allergic reaction to the, the um, saliva of the snake. And I, we, I worked with one person who had a pet uh, garter snake up in one of the field centers and she got bit by it and her hand became very swollen. You would have sworn it was a rattlesnake bite. It wasn't. They treated with antibiotics. So when you're dealing with any animal, especially a wild animal, you have to take some caution. I mean, I've seen people feeding squirrels and the squirrel there is a park not too far from here where the squirrels will climb up on you and actually be in your arm and they'll take food from you. Doing that isn't maybe the brightest thing because those squirrels could carry ticks or all sorts of other diseases. So uh, I suggest that we leave wildlife wild. Uh, feeding chickadees, that's one thing. Feeding squirrels, that's quite another. I wouldn't encourage you to feed deer or coyote even though it's wonderful to get close to some of these animals, you've got to remember that they are wild animals. Uh, and as I've got a, a launch for the bear book coming up next week, uh, people are so stupid when it comes to animals. Uh, they do stupid things like, um, they, I've seen people walk up and put their little daughters on the back of black bears. I've seen people try and pet a bull moose in uh, Algonquin Park. These are wild animals. We want to keep them wild. Enjoy them. Let them know you're around. But don't try and interfere with them and certainly don't try and feed them. Um, I have a whole list of horror stories about things that go wrong. But I won't do that today, necessarily. Very sad. Um. Yeah, and I see someone in the chat actually says, I love snakes and we love snakes at Riverwood too. Um, a lot of the, Yeah, a lot of the ones you'll find at Riverwood, they're quite small. They almost look like little worms, they're very tiny. <laughs> yep. um, another really great question came in from Michelle. I know you can't speak for others, but do wildlife photographers or documenters ever intervene off camera in precarious situations while filming for say a baby in peril or is it just an absolute no? I would say no, but it must be very difficult. Uh, I've been in the situation a few times um, and so I know other photographers have too. The general rule, for instance, in Africa, um, we once saw a zebra that was a zebra foal that was stuck in the mud. And the rule in the Serengeti is you do not interfere. And we did not interfere. We knew that that calf was going to die. So, or that foal was going to die. So we left it. Uh, it did have a happy ending because some rangers came along and helped it out. Um, but there are 250,000 zebras. So the fact that that one survived, excuse me for one second. Uh, that one survived and did fine, but it you know, wouldn't have made any difference in the big picture. Um, I remember a few years ago, we, I was out in Yellowstone doing some work with wolves and grizzlies and a bison and got trapped in the mud. And it was right by the road. 
And for two days, you could hear this animal thumping its head against the, the mud and trying to get out. And eventually it died. The park service did not interfere with it. We did not interfere with it. What happened was uh, wolves fed on it, coyotes fed on it, black bears fed on it, grizzly bears fed on it. I saw my first ever, ever turkey vulture in Yellowstone. In fact, I recorded, I think, the first ever sighting of a turkey vulture in Yellowstone that came to feed on it. It was part of nature. Nature can be quite harsh. So we do not interfere. I do not suggest you interfere. Um, a lot of people like, I remember a few years, well, many years ago, my wife and I are both teachers and we teach at different schools. And she called me up and said they had an owl. And I said, where'd you get an owl from? And the, some kid picked it up and brought it into the school. And I said, okay, what you've got is probably a sawwood owl. I went down and sure enough, the sawwood owl was perched on a branch, minding its own business, having a nice doze because they do that. The kid reached up and grabbed it, didn't get hurt, took it in and there was in a box. What do you do with it? Well, basically what you do with it is you take it back to where you found it and you leave it there. You should have left it there in the first place. A lot of people will find baby robins lying on the ground. Um, and this is something many of you may have experienced. What do you do? Well, do nothing is my advice or put it in the bush. Mom and dad are probably going to feed it. But you need to know too that robins will probably have three nestings in a good season. And most of those babies are not going to survive. That could be a dozen babies. As soon as they fledge and they fly out, dad starts to feed them and mom is sitting on the nest with another batch. So something else is going to eat that robin. But it is really hard to see this poor baby chirping there and thinking it's not going to get fed. Leave it be. Let nature take its course. And if you find that difficult to do, then you're with a lot of the people in my, my business that are out there photographing this stuff day after day. Um, it's just nature. If you watch the eagle cams, there's an excellent one in Pittsburgh. There are three baby eagles there. and One of them is really tiny. And that tiny one isn't getting fed. And you watch the video and you think, there's mom and dad, they brought a big fish in. And little junior isn't getting fed. Well, that's nature. Little Junior is kind of the, the spare in the eagle family. And if the bigger ones, for whatever reason, die, he'll have a chance. But generally, they don't all get raised. It's the same with owls. We're, nature is surprisingly efficient, but it is also surprisingly cold. And understanding that there are no good or bad guys in nature is something that's really difficult for people to understand and come to grips with. Next question. Um, and just, I guess a question that popped up in my head when you're talking about this, Dave, and I completely agree with everything you're saying, but how do you determine the difference between what is nature and what is human influenced impact on our environment? So let's say if a turtle's crossing the road, yeah, do you intervene in point. that case? If a turtle's crossing the road and it's this time of year, Try and make sure it gets across. One thing you shouldn't do is say, oh, the pond is over here, turtle, but you're going this way. I'm going to take you. I'm going to put you over here. And then the poor turtle's got to say, like, what the heck? I was going over there to lay eggs. Now I got to go back up the hill? Come on, leave me alone. <laughs> but if a turtle is hit by a car, obviously, or it's in danger of being hit by a car, you should try and do what you can, but you don't stand in the middle of the road and flag down traffic on the 401 to stop traffic from hitting a goose. That's not a good idea. Uh, but where the case, where it's definitely something that's man-made that has caused the problem, mm -hmm. then I think you should interfere. And there are lots of re wildlife rehab places around that will help you out, whether it's a, you know, a raccoon that the tree has fallen down and you know the parents have gone, um, maybe you pick that up and you take it to a rehab center uh, or you see an animal that's injured uh, and that you can capture safely. Um, and 
you know, if it's definitely human, you might be wanting to interfere. But you might see a fox walking down the road towards you and you think, oh, no, that's really unusual. But these days, foxes are pretty common sights in much of Mississauga and other places. It's because they've learned to live with people. If the fox is behaving erratically and is listless, and then you may want to call wildlife services because it's probably got some disease, most likely distemper. But a healthy fox trotting down the road, just enjoy it and don't try and interfere and uh, just let things be. But only interfere, I think, the bottom line is when it's clearly a man-made or human-caused um, trauma to the species, to the animal. Awesome. And um, I'm just going to do one comment and one question, and then we can get to the next uh, portion. So Elaine has said in the Q&A chat, she loves to walk the trails. Um, you might want to mention that it's a great idea not to litter and pick up when you see litter. And that is awesome, Elaine. If you're doing it safely, picking up litter is always a great way to help our wildlife. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat here, um, Carrie has asked or said, I don't see very many deer at Riverwood in the daytime. Do they come out at night? Are there any other animals that come out at nighttime at Riverwood? Um, deer are for the most part crepuscular, which means they're active a few hours before and after dawn and dusk. However, um, a lot of what we know about wildlife rhythms in the, during the day are basically based on our observations of animals that are hunted or pursued or whatever. So, you know, when I go to Africa, the, the first time I went to Africa, the the knowledge was, well, you don't go out in the middle of the day because you won't see anything. You got to go in the morning, in the afternoon. But animals in the Serengeti are pretty used to people. Now, most of them like to hunt in the cooler weather, which is in the morning or the late afternoon. But you can see all sorts of great animal sites during the day. And the same is true in national parks. With Riverwood, the deer tend to not be active during the middle part of the day. You occasionally see them in the winter, you might see them. Um, probably that's partly safety, partly routine, but uh, there are a lot of animals that are primarily active at night, like the skunks, uh, the opossums are around mostly at night. Coyotes, because they are sometimes pursued, are more active in the evening. Uh, owls certainly at night, although during the summer owls will hunt during the day. So there's no real set answer. I mean, we, we kind of pigeonhole animals and their behavior, but it's possible to see really interesting things at all times of the day. Although I would be surprised, honestly, to see a lot of deer activity in the spring at lunchtime. You know, so you're probably right. You don't see them as much. All right, should we go back and share the screen for a quick second or two? Sure, sounds good. All right. And let's see if this works. You should be seeing a picture of me and a moose. Are you, can you see that, Stephanie? Now a chipmunk? All right, good. So go back to them. These are just some pictures that I've taken that illustrate, I hope, uh, let's see if I can get these to move. Things about wildlife, like, for instance, chipmunks. I am amazed um, from my travels to see the number of species of chipmunks. So there's six species in that picture. But there are far more than that in North America. When you go, when you start to study wildlife, be prepared to be surprised. There's so much to learn. Uh, I certainly am no way an expert. Uh, I enjoy wildlife, I enjoy doing the research on it, but I am constantly learning things. Cottontail rabbits are, this is the time of year to look for cottontails. They're having their first set of babies, they're out feeding on the green up, they're more active, they're certainly in our backyards and in our forests. Uh, best time to look for them, I find, is early in the morning uh, and at night, but hard to photograph them at night. Beavers are doing really well in Mississauga. I'm working on a documentary on beavers. 
and I keep finding new lodges. And in many cases, the beavers are quite cooperative. Now, you take the knowledge that you have of these small critters and you go to Australia and suddenly you find yourself facing animals that are quite different, like the musky rat kangaroo. This is a small kangaroo. It's about the size of, well, a muskrat, um, hence its name, musky rat. And it hops like a kangaroo. It's nocturnal. And so one of the things I did before I went to Australia, uh, because I knew I was going to do a lot of night photography, was I practiced night photography with raccoons in my backyard. And it paid off. I did see some wildlife uh, during the day, but most of the wildlife in Australia, I found, were very active early in the day, late in the day, or at night. This was one of my favorite shots. This is a rufous owl with a ring-tailed possum. And that was taken all oh, quite a distance away. Just it was amazing to see it, but it was also amazing when I got the picture back and it actually turned out. This was done before we had digital and I didn't know for about a month whether or not I had the picture. Some bats. I really enjoy bats. I think bats are having a tough time of it. These are fruit bats. They're flying, they're also called flying foxes. They have a wingspan like a boat like that. And where these ones are photographed was over the Sydney Opera House in Sydney. And I enjoy the opera a little bit, but I enjoy the bats a lot more, but that's maybe my lack of taste. Yellowstone, boy, if you want an experience that is close to going to Africa, but isn't Africa, go to Yellowstone. And if you can go there in May or June or September or October, the crowds aren't there. The wildlife are more active. This uh, summer is the time to see the buffalo bulls rutting and fighting. Uh, just amazing spots. This is what we call a flim or a lip curl. The moose has scented the female moose's urine to see if she's uh, ready to breed. And he has an organ in the top of his mouth called a Jacobson's organ. And he sort of whiffs the scent in and sort of samples it. And if he finds that she's ready for breeding, he looks really dumb. And he curls his lips up and he puts his head up and he sticks his neck up and he kind of looks around like that and looks really dumb. Lions do the exact same thing for the exact same reason and they look just as dumb. If I was selling that to a book, not me, but some people would sell that as a lion roaring. Lions don't roar like that. That lion is just tested to see if the lioness is ready um, <clears throat> to breed. Uh, this is back to the zebra crossings. Predators and prey always fascinate me. This is from a talk I did uh, about the Serengeti. Uh, most times, in fact, just about every time I've seen this, the animal got away. When it didn't, I saw it after it had been killed. But this was one of the more unusual events I was able to watch, and that's lions and hyenas interacting. Lions and hyenas both act occupy the same niche, the same tier in the food chain. They're both the dominant predators and they're always in competition. We don't have anything like that at Riverwood. We have coyotes and we have foxes. The closest we would probably have is great horned owls and red-tailed hawks, but they're, they've divided their properties up. One is at night, one is at the daytime. In Africa, the hyenas and lions both are very competitive. This is a coyote hunting mice and voles. They use their ears to locate them and then they leap. And sometimes they play with their food. There was an article recently in, uh, I think it was either CVC or the Mississauga News. If you see a coyote following you, don't be upset, especially if you're walking a dog. Coyotes do not like dogs because they're natural born enemies. So the coyote, when they have pups, will often watch dogs and make sure they leave the property. Uh, this coyote was making sure I left the property. 
Um, there was no dangerous interaction. This was at Riverwood. It was quite peaceful and the coyote um, and I got along quite well. He yelled at me, I apologized to it, and we went our separate ways. If you wanna learn about wildlife, go to zoos. Zoos have gotten so much better than they were 50 years ago about displaying animals in natural habitats. There was a lady by the name of Jane Goodall, who you probably have heard of, and she discovered that chimps were tool users. Well, nobody knew this until the 60s. Zoos, clever zoos, caught on and started providing the chimps with a treat and the tools, but they didn't tell the chimps how to do it. They had to figure it out. And to watch that in a zoo, even in a zoo, is amazing. Watching monkeys and primates in the wild is equally fascinating. This is a colobus monkey. It's found in Africa. It's an old world monkey. This is a howler monkey. It's found in Costa Rica and South America. The howler monkeys and the old world monkeys are distantly related. Howler monkeys, like most new world monkeys, have prehensile tails. And this is a glogal. You've probably never heard of a glogal. This is the greater glogal. It is a type of primate, but it is more primitive. And when you go on safari or when you go to Yellowstone, you're bound to see animals you've never seen of or heard of. And that is part of the joy of getting out in the wild. Part of the joy in the getting out in the wild too is seeing the really, really rare. This is a big tusker. It has since passed away. He is about 80 years old when I took this. There used to be a lot of animals this size, but as elephants have been poached, the big tuskers have disappeared. It's rare to see them. There are probably less than 100 big tuskers in all of Africa now. This was filmed in the Ngorogoro crater. And this is the relative of an elephant. This is a hyrex. And one of the things I've learned about as a wildlife uh, student of wildlife is the way they're classifying them. And there's this new classification called Afrotheria. And they've discovered that there's a branch of mammals that evolved in Africa that are closely related. This one is about the size of a groundhog. And this one is the only one resident in North America, the manatee. And the, the relationship between these three species well, that's maybe a topic for another, another story. Hippopotamuses are distantly related to whales. These are beluga whales up in the Arctic. Dolphins are a type of whale. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, they think they're fish. They are, of course, mammals. Using a camera in photography has always been something, or using a camera in science has always been something that has intrigued me. A lot of work has been done documenting animals with cameras, whether it's lions or in this case, humpback whales. You notice the three tails, they're all different. The tail patterns don't change. So they can follow the life of a whale from birth to death if they can get a picture of their tails. And there are volumes of books published with nothing but whales' tails in it. You wouldn't think kitty litter and kitty waste would kill sea otters because cats live on the land, sea otters live in the ocean, but in places like Carmel and uh, other places by the sea where both these species are found, when rain washes kitty litter and kitty waste into the ocean, it has had a detrimental effect on the sea otters. These are the sorts of connections that just fascinate me. Conflict in nature. The elephant seal there were fewer than nine left. And a budding naturalist, when he found a few remaining elephant seals on an island, he shot them all because he wanted to preserve their skins. As far as he knew, he shot the last elephant seals in the world, but he didn't. From the nine that somehow survived, there are now over 100,000 elephant seals on the coast of California. 100,000! It's amazing. And they all came from those nine animals, which brings in all sorts of questions about genetics and interbreeding and whatnot. So wildlife raises questions. And then sometimes 
Animals just do stuff that surprise you. These are sea lions porpoising. They're deliberately jumping out of the water and playing. Now, this would have a use if they were being chased by a white shark. And in California, they are often chased by white sharks. And this is the bull sea lion that is trying to give me a message. I was snorkeling in the Galapagos and suddenly this sea lion started coming up and blowing bubbles in front of me and approaching quite closely. I was told later by the guide that the sea lion was trying to tell me to leave its pool, which I did. And in that case, I will end this one, stop sharing, go back to here, and we'll take a few more questions and wrap it up in time for the next presentation in about nine minutes. Awesome. All right. So I think we have time for two really great questions that actually came from Facebook. Um, Monica has asked, I would be interested in learning more on how to use storytelling with photography and video for wildlife conservation. Uh, well, I'm in the process of learning that myself, Monica. So um, I find that when I'm, I'm looking for stories, I look for the dramatic and the humorous and the appealing. Um, and sometimes the appealing is the weakest point. Uh, stories about crocodiles don't get told often enough because crocodiles are ugly, but there is a dramatic element to the story. And there are reasons for telling stories. You'll have to decide on what your reason is. My reason to tell stories is to get people to realize just how marvelous and intriguing nature is. I don't do an awful lot of the doom and gloom stuff in my videos. Uh, I think Stephanie has posted some links for you um, because I think there's a lot of that out there. Everybody knows about polar bears and panda bears and the forest being burned down. I sort of take the other approach that I want people to engage with nature and learn to love it and then take a look at these other programs uh, like the BBC Earth and whatnot where they highlight the, the damage that we are doing. I, my love of nature translates into me taking action. And I think that's what you want to do with stories. You want to make people aware, you want to get them involved. And if they get involved, they'll do something about it. And that's been my approach. I find it's easier to tell stories with pictures than it is with video, but I find the video more compelling and more interesting. Uh, simply because um, you, the way you can edit it. If you want to know more about video storytelling, uh, my website, DaveTaylorWildlife.com, there is a section that I put out for students called Media Literacy, and it talks about some of the techniques and tricks that we use when we're creating stories. And everybody should realize that when you watch these videos, they or look at a still picture you're seeing the action i've sat for hours watching a lioness in the middle of a field waiting for it to do something and the lioness just lay there and became a rock and the wildebeest ignored it and after three or four hours the lioness finally made an attempt and it didn't get anything i'm working with bald eagles right now for me to get a two or three second clip of a video of an eagle flying in, I will spend four hours just standing there. Uh, that's why um, nature photographers are outstanding in their fields, because we just stand there and that's a joke. It's a pretty weak joke, but it is a joke. Anyhow, and Stephanie got it, so, and I'm gonna give up my career as a stand-up <laughs> comedian right about now. Next question, Stephanie. I thought it was pretty good, Dave. <laughs> Um, the last question we'll take is also from Facebook and it's from Vicki. And where is the best location in Southern Ontario to take young children to observe wildlife? And she said other than Riverwood, but I would first like to say that Riverwood is a prime spot <laughs> to bring young children to view wildlife. But what do you think, Dave? Um, if you live in the Toronto area, Sam Smith, or Colonel Sam Smith Park at the foot of Kipling Avenue, uh, is great during spring migration, which will be starting in another few weeks. If you can go further afield, uh, when it's open again, the birding festival, the bird festival at Point Pelee is 
incredible because there's so many knowledgeable people there. But if you just want to go for a quiet walk, uh, any nature trail in any city is probably going to be of value. The, um, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton, uh, areas along that marshy area are just tremendous. Um, uh, in the winter, a walk along the lake shore can produce all sorts of variety of interesting ducks. Look for people like me with big cameras standing around looking at something, especially in the winter. Uh, you might find a snowy owl, you might find you're looking at uh, a really neat red-tailed hawk. Um, it, it's surprising where wildlife is found. I don't know if you're the Vicky that I think you are, but if you are that Vicky and you live down in Niagara, the Niagara River is uh, uh, a spectacular place at certain times of the year. Um, there are conservation areas down there that are really good. And be open to not just seeing wildlife, but seeing, you know, waterfalls and the changes in color and the spring plants and flowers. It's, it's amazing. Uh, of course, Riverwood is, actually Riverwood is not the best place to see wildlife. Come on, uh, Dave. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's, and it's gotten better. I've been walking it for 30 years and I can tell you since the Riverwood Conservancy in the city created the park and work on the park to maintain it, it is really wonderful. But um, there are other places. The thing with Riverwood is it's becoming popular and uh, that's great that people go there to see it. But for me, being alone in the woods with a deer or a coyote or something like that, that's still kind of the dream. And there are places where that can happen, but it's usually a case of wandering and walking. I have a, a, a former student of mine. I taught her when she was in grade four and I met her again when she came to one of my talks at Riverwood like many, many years later. Um, I was like 25 when I taught her. Uh, she started to go out taking pictures and I am so blown away by the pictures she's taken. Uh, she gets out there and she's seeing all sorts of really neat birds and neat animals and neat places. And she sends me these little notes telling me that there's such and such here. And the places I've gone because of her suggestions are places that you wouldn't expect. They're just common little places that you walk by every day and suddenly there's something fantastic. You want to see wildlife? Get out and look. Uh, it's there, but take the time. Take a casual walk, not a power walk. Um, take binoculars and cameras and just sit and listen and learn. It's it's amazing experience. And Riverwood is still pretty good. Spring walk in Riverwood. Uh, Derek, who is our conservation specialist, was telling me he saw deer, uh, coyotes, three coyotes, toads, frogs, a few other animals. And that was uh, last week, I think, on a nice yeah. day. So yeah, it's there. And once we get our feeding trails up and working again, it'll just get better and better. So do join us at Riverwood and come see us. And I'm going to put a pitch in for the next talk. Um, Party Safari is going to do a wonderful job at 2.30. Uh, I've had her out to talk at Riverwood a number of times. She just does a fantastic presentation. So if you can come back and join us, please do. And I want to thank you. It's been great. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, thank you, Stephanie, as always, for your advice and support. I'll thank turn it you, back Dave. to you. Thank you so much. Such a great presentation. I We've got so many comments and questions. And once again, we run out of time for all of them. Um, but thank you very much, Dave. The, the videos were amazing. Um, like Dave said, if you want to join us in half an hour, Party Safari is going to be showing some live reptiles and amphibians and all sorts of things. So please join us then. And if you have the financial means to support the Riverwood Conserv Conservancy, we would greatly appreciate any contribution you can make today. You can give at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. And that is it. I guess we will see you next week, right, Dave? Yeah, for the Black Bear launch. I was Yay. just going to mention that. <laughs> see you then. Thanks, folks. Thank Have you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.